Can I have five minutes? should be able to do that, so. It's unknown, man. I do, but it's warm. It's a bit too warm. Cool. Evening, everyone. Evening. Shall I turn off the fan? You know what? Uh, if you... Um, we'll start now, if that's okay, we'll start now. Is it, can you guys hear me okay? Or is the fan like super loud? <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Hold on, let me try and boost it a bit more. Louder, yeah, I think that's louder. Just cool. Um, yeah, hey everyone. Um, sorry, uh, this is very different, uh, as you will see, uh, and it's different. We thank God because of the great work of Highland Community Church, um, which is the church from the states, which are helping us. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, uh, a church in America has come to help us do some painting. So the main sanctuary is being painted and the smelling of paint. So for the sake of your health, we thought we'll move upstairs. Um, but everything else is the same. Uh, everything else is the same. We're still doing 
going to continue our series on spiritual warfare. Um, we're still looking through the armor of God. We're still going to have a time of uh, questions. So really similar, really similar setup to what we would normally do. Uh, questions wise, you can still come up here if you're here in person. Obviously, you got you get preference, so you can just ask a question. Otherwise, we'll just go through the questions that have been asked on the Slido. The link for that's on the YouTube. Um, yeah, not sure much else to say. Uh, let me pray. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you, yeah, for this glorious day. We thank you for the wonderful weather. Um, but Lord, we thank you for our lives. Thank you for sustaining us, sustaining us and keeping us. Lord, even just looking back at these last few years with the pandemic and the great loss of life, we, we thank you that we're here. Um, we know so many people lost their lives, young and old, uh, different kind of situations. Lord, we're here. We thank you. And Lord, as we're here, we pray that you would give us the grace to live wholeheartedly for your glory. Bless this time that we spend together. Uh, bless not just this time, but the time we spend after speaking and talking. Lord, may it all be pointing to you. Uh, fill us afresh with your spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the um, text we've been looking at, the main text we've been looking at is Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. Perhaps the most critical text in um, the Bible on this issue of spiritual warfare. Um, we're talking through spiritual warfare because it's a really practical, important thing. The Bible tells us we are at war with Satan and his armies. And so therefore, we need to know what it looks like to wage war well. Um, apart from the gospel itself, believing the gospel, really it's difficult to think of anything more critical than actually knowing how to engage well in spiritual warfare. So that's what our series has been all about. And our main passage is Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. I'm going to read it. Each week we're going to read Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. The reason is, even though we're looking at a piece of an armor at a time, when Paul wrote this, he wrote this together. The whole armor works together. So we, we always want to think of each piece of the armor in context of all the other pieces of the armor. So, but the reading is Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. I'm going to read that for us now, which says, uh, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth, buckled round your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in change. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. So that's the armor. That's the, the passage that deals with the armor. And each week we've tried to remind ourselves that when Paul talks about this issue of the armor of God, he doesn't pluck it out of nowhere. It's not just him thinking of what a nice analogy may be. Paul, as often is the case with Paul, as often is the case with the New Testament, is taken directly from the Old Testament. The armor of God is an Old Testament concept, um, right? Before it becomes a New Testament concept. And it refers first and foremost to God's armor. So we're going to see that once again in Isaiah 59. We've read this before, but again, it's helpful to remind ourselves from verse 15. Truth is nowhere to be found, and whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as his breastplate, and the helmet of salvation on his head. 
He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. According to what they have done, so will he repay wrath to his enemies and retribution to his foes. He will pay the islands their due. The phrase there at the top there on the slide is what Paul takes, right? When Paul says, talks about the breastplate of righteousness, he is explicitly quoting Isaiah 59, right? Um, we saw this last week with the belt of truth. That's a quotation from Isaiah 11, speaking of Jesus Christ. And all of this is to say that first and foremost, the armor of God is actually God's own armor. It's something that God wages war with, that God then gives to his children to wage war with, right? But it's actually God's own armor. It's like God is giving us his armor, right? It's, so when we read of the armor of God, the armor of God isn't godly armor or, um, you know, Christian armor. It's actually God's armor, right? The armor of God as in belonging to God, right? Um, that God gives us. We get divine weapons in our battle against Satan. And one of these divine weapons that God uses, that God enables us to use, is the breastplate of righteousness. I thought about giving a picture of a breastplate, but you guys know what the breastplate is, that piece of metal over the chest, right? Keeps your heart and all that stuff, right? That's the, that's the breastplate. Um, and Paul says it's a breastplate of righteousness. Which leads us to the first question, which is, what righteousness? Uh, what righteousness? Um, the word righteousness can mean a few things. I said three things there, but really I'm going to look at two things. It can mean at least two things. When you, when you see the word righteousness in the Bible, righteousness is a really important biblical word. It's one of those words that, that's really critical. And in fact, um, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that understanding the gospel correctly really depends on understanding what we mean by righteousness and how the Bible uses righteousness. So essentially, breaking it down to two, I was thinking of three initially, but two, two significant things. Righteousness can refer to one, moral behavior, righteous good behavior. So if someone is displaying righteousness, they're displaying behavior that accords to God's law. It's according to the standard. So sometimes the Bible can speak in the Old Testament, it talks about how you should use righteous scales, right? What that means is it's scales that are according to the standard. Why? Because some people had unbalanced scales so that, you know, they could cheat people, essentially, right? Um, they would weigh it up on the scales and you think you're paying for this, but it's something totally different, right? That's an unrighteous scale. It doesn't meet the standard. Well, righteousness sometimes, when the Bible speaks about righteousness, sometimes it's referring to just righteous behavior, right? Um, our righteous behavior. Um, but righteousness also can refer to a status before God. That is righteousness, which means that we are acquitted, we are innocent in God's courtroom. So sometimes the Bible can speak of righteousness in terms of our behavior. Sometimes it can speak of righteousness as this thing, which is really a status thing, that we are righteous. And in the Bible, that status of righteous is a gift of God, right? The, the gift of righteousness. So to use different terms that the Bible uses, there is a righteousness that is by the law, that is based on what we do, and there is the righteousness that is by faith, which is we trust God, and God by faith justifies us. He calls us righteous. He counts us righteous because of what Jesus has done. That righteousness isn't to do with what we've done. Right? Um, Romans 4, Paul talks about how God justifies the ungodly. Actually, as sinners, when we come to trust in Jesus Christ, God sees us in Christ such that his righteousness is accounted for our righteousness. So there's that righteousness. If you want to use more technical terms, imputed righteousness is the more fancy term for it. But there's righteousness that is a gift, a status that is a gift that comes by faith. And there is righteousness that actually refers to our behavior. Both of those righteousnesses are in the Bible. The Bible uses righteousness in those ways both times. And if you lose sight of either of those, you've lost sight of something really critical. So all of that to say, what righteousness are we talking about here? Um, because it would be, it'd be quite different, actually. It's very different. Is Paul saying that the breastplate is 
actually the status we have in Christ is what is our armor against Satan or is Paul saying that actually righteous living is part of our armor against Satan and I think on balance he's actually talking about righteous living the reason for that is, and now this is actually really a helpful thing in general, if you're trying to puzzle something like this out, the best way to do it is to think, how is this word used in the immediate context? How is this word used in the book? And in the book, again and again, when Paul deals with it, uses the language of righteousness, he's actually talking about righteous living, right? Uh, so Ephesians 5, for example, he's talking about righteous living. So I think the breastplate of righteousness is not so much a reference to our status in Christ, though we are soon going to talk about the helmet of salvation, which essentially is speaking of that. So that is part of our armor, but I don't think that's what Paul is talking about here. I think he's actually saying that righteous living is part of our armor, part of the armor that God gives us in our fight against Satan. So with that in view, we're going to do one more Bible reading. Uh, that's talking about righteousness as in righteous living. I'm going to read from Romans. Um, I'll read from Romans 6, uh, 11 through to 23. Uh, this passage, if it seems familiar, we did it recently. Chinelo, who's right here, uh, got baptized, uh, and we looked at this passage. Um, but let me read it. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law but under grace. What then, shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God, though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I'm using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things that you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin, and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that's, I think, one of the clearest passages that deals with what it looks like for us as Christians to be striving for righteousness, which Paul says is a breastplate. It's part of our armor. So really briefly, what we're going to do is we're going to think two reasons why righteousness is important in our fights against Satan, and two, I think two or three reasons, or two ways we can pursue righteousness, right, as part of the armor of God. The first one is this. Um, the first one relates to the issue of assurance. Um, and by assurance, what I mean by that is assurance is the confidence that a Christian has that they are saved, that they belong to God. And righteousness is key to assurance. So going way back a few weeks ago to when we were looking at Satan's schemes, one of the things we said, uh, well, one of the things we said, because one of the things the Bible says, is that Satan accuses. One of the things that Satan does is he's the accuser of the brethren. He accuses God's people. He uh, accuses us to God, but he also accuses us to ourselves. He seeks to condemn us. He seeks to cause us to think that we do not belong to Jesus Christ, right? Um, right? Now, practically, if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you, you would have experienced this. In all likelihood, most Christians have times in their Christian life where they have serious questions as to, actually, am I saved? Like, 
Am I actually saved? Do I know Jesus? Like, am I going to heaven, right? Uh, am I actually saved? Was it, yeah, maybe I'm not saved, right? And so Satan does that. That's something that Satan does. And primarily, when, when Satan does that, the, the, the primary thing we do is we hold him to the cross, right? Um, Romans 8.1, right? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? We remind ourselves that actually, if we're trusting in Jesus Christ, then we, we are saved, right? There's no condemnation for us. We remind ourselves of passages like uh, Romans 8.33, which says, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, he was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and is interceding for us. We remind ourselves of passages like 1 John uh, 2, 1. Uh, we'll spend a bit of time in 1 John. 1 John 2, 1 says this, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So when we sin and Satan comes to condemn us, what we do is we look to Jesus Christ and we look to the cross, right? We, we fight the accusations of Satan through the cross. That's the primary way, that's the primary ground of our assurance. And I don't, nothing I'm going to say next negates that. Nevertheless, nevertheless, those who have been saved grow in righteousness. One thing the Bible says for sure is that once we've been saved, we actually grow in righteousness. We, we grow in becoming more like Jesus Christ. One of the things that marks God's people necessarily is that. To use the more, I guess, technical terms, those who have been justified, those who God as he says, look, you're righteous because of Jesus Christ. Those who've been justified, they grow in sanctification, which means they grow in holiness, they grow in righteousness, right? Um, and therefore, righteousness does have a significant role to play. Growing in righteousness has a significant role to play in our assurance. So if you, if you want to rebut Satan's accusations... We hold to the cross fundamentally because ultimately, no matter how much, we're never going to see enough righteousness in us to justify us. Our righteousness is never perfect, but there is a growing in righteousness that is essential to assurance, essential, right? And it's essential because um, God says it so, right? Um, you see this in several places. So when um, we read at Romans 8, um, uh, earlier, Romans 8 is the passage that tells us there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But it then describes those people. Verse 12, um, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So those who are trusting in Jesus Christ are also those who are putting to death sin. They're growing in righteousness. We read 1 John 2 uh, a bit earlier, right, um, which speaks about, look, if you sin, we have the assurance that actually we have Jesus Christ. But 1 John also teaches us, right, 1 John 2, just like two verses later, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Everyone who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in that person. Later on in 1 John 2, verse 9, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. And in fact, all the way through 1 John, 1 John makes the point that actually one of the things that helps you to know that you're a Christian is that you do what God tells you to do. In other words, righteousness. Righteousness is key to our assurance, right? Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father in heaven, right? Um, so what that means is, if we're to fight Satan's accusations, a significant part of that will be striving and growing in righteousness. If we fail to do that, we will lose this battle. Really, what's at stake here is, um, is, 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 is not so much, to some extent, it's how well we do in our Christian life. 
But to some extent, there's a, there's a sense in which, now of course, if we look at it from God's view, those who, are, those who are truly saved are kept, they're preserved, right? God keeps those he saved, the Bible is clear on that. But there's a way you could say, almost humanly speaking, failing in the striving for righteousness by the grace of God will mean that you will lose this battle e- eternally, right? So 1 Timothy um, 1, 18 to 19, um, Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command uh, in keeping with the prophecies once made about you so that by recalling them you might fight the battle well, holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and had so have suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. Um, so here's, here's the thing, and it's really important, just practically. Satan's constantly going to be seeking to undermine our assurance. And we constantly need to go to the cross. That's, that's the key. But if we're not growing in righteousness, that, that will not hold. It won't hold. When you see people, nine times out of ten, almost in every case that I've seen, at least close enough to see, you see someone walk away from the faith. I think really often at the heart of it is this issue of the breastplate of righteousness. Because there's not been a growing in righteousness, there's been a lack and lack of assurance and assurance, and there's a condemnation and condemnation to the extent that what ends up happening is you just despair. And you lose faith, and you think, actually, what's the point in doing this? There's no amount of doctrine that will keep you from that if you're not growing in righteousness. Like, if we're not actually striving to grow in righteousness, there's no amount of, I, I know what the gospel says, that will keep, because actually, you depart from that, as Paul says, you make a shipwreck of your faith. You, you'll ruin your faith. If you want to make it long term, in the Christian life, we must be growing in righteousness. Like, necessarily, that's part of the battle. It's part of the battle to be able to say, right, to Satan, fundamentally, what we say to Satan is, Christ Jesus died for my sins. And actually, one of the reasons I can see that is, you know what, even incrementally, even in small ways, even though I'm not the person I know I ought to be, by God's grace, I am not the person I once was. The Christian has to be able to say that, right? If, if you want to fight Satan, you have to be able to say, look, I, I, look, when I look at my shortcomings and I look at where the, what the standard is, I just see how far short I am, and I thank God for the course. But you know what? I know that God is working in my life because God has changed me. I'm not the person I was, right? The kind of Christianity that is purely mental, that says I just mentally say some things in my head, but I have not experienced any kind of life change. There's no difference in terms of how I deal with sin. There's no growth in holiness, no growth in righteousness. But because... I know uh, some doctrine so that doesn't hold it doesn't keep part of fighting the battle against Satan is being serious about righteousness because of this issue of assurance um, right because in God's design growth in righteousness does have a role to play in our assurance which therefore means it has a role to play in our fight against Satan so the first reason why righteousness is so essential is that is, for, is, is to do with our assurance. But secondly, it's to do with uh, communion, right? Um, communion with God. Um, this is just one of those kind of straightforward facts that the Bible tells you, but you, just the Christian life tells you, right? Sin separates us from God, right? Sin separates us from God. Uh, Psalm 66 um, and verse 18. Um, Psalm 66 verse 18 says... Um, psalmist is praying um, and he says if I had cherished sin in my heart the Lord would not have listened if I cherished sin in my heart the Lord would not have listened if, if I want communion with God if I want to pray to God and I want relationship with God I cannot be treasuring sin in my heart keeping sin, loving sin in my heart, and expect that I'm having some relationship with God. It's it's not possible, right? Uh, Earlier on in the book of Psalms, Psalm 24, um, 
Psalm 24 says, verse 3, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. What are the qualifications for communion with God? Well, we cannot be cherishing sin in our heart, got that pet sin in our heart, and expect that we will have some kind of communion with uh, God. Matthew 5, 8, right? Uh, the, it's the pure in heart that will see God. The Bible, the Bible says this all over the place. Uh, 1 Peter 3, um, Peter speaks to husbands and tells husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way or according to knowledge, right? Otherwise, your prayers will be hindered. Uh, 1 Peter 3, 7, right? Otherwise, your prayers will be hindered. Um, Sunday, nay, right? It's a great sermon. Jesus says, if you're at the temple and you've, um, you're about to sacrifice and you realize that actually uh, your brother has something against you, drop your sacrifice and, and go and make it right with your brother. You, you know what's so striking about that, right, is obviously the parallel in one sense is going to church, except it's not. You have to remember where the temple, Jesus is probably in Galilee when he's saying this. The temple is in Jerusalem. It's days, this is days journey. If you've made a three day journey to go to the temple, but there's sin that needs to be dealt with, Stop that. If you need to, make the return journey and sort that out. Why? Because actually when we're, when we're holding sin in our heart and we come and we want to have communion with God, there is no communion. There is no union with, there is no union with God. Where we know there's something, there's an issue there, there's something that God is not pleased with. And we just set this aside and just think God's going to be fine. You know, God will be fine, you know, we will be all right. I'm forgiven, you know, the cross, you know, let's set that aside. Um, the Bible says there is no communion. When we cherish sin in our heart, there's no communion. Now, why is that so essential? It's essential because, actually, the power to fight Satan comes from God. Right? Uh, Ephesians 6, uh, 10. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The way we fight Satan is in God's strength, which means we must be connected to him. Jesus, John 15, right? I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from union with God, we've got no, we're left alone. We've got no hope against Satan, right? Apart from being connected to God, we've got no, actual communion with God is the key to our power right, of fighting. But actually, outside of righteousness, we won't have communion with God. God cannot be mocked, right? God cannot be mocked. There's no amount of, and of course, no one knows what's going on. I don't know what's going on with you. You don't know what's going on with me. I can be here talking, preaching, and so on and so forth, and praying. Yeah, there might be something going on in my life, right? That is not that, and, you know, everyone could be impressed and happy, and things could be looking fine. There's no communion with God, right? Um, uh, and therefore, there's no actual power to fight Satan. So this breastplate is key. Um, it's, it's key. And there's nothing that replaces the need for righteousness in the Christian life, right? And so in one sense, there's a kind of vicious cycle to this. The Christian who's not growing in righteousness will be more exposed to Satan and therefore will be even more exposed to sin and spiraling downwards, right? Um, spiraling downwards, um, the breastplate of righteousness is key. Okay, so how do we grow in this? How do we seek this breastplate of righteousness? If it's so important, how do we grow in it? Um, one is just through, through scripture, right? Um, Ephesians 4, uh, just earlier in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 4, uh, verse 22. Um, I'll start from verse 20. Um, but I'll start from verse 17. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their heart. 
Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to be put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So in one sense, Paul, when he talks about righteousness later, has already told us what the key to righteousness is in the previous, well, not the previous chapter, chapter before the previous chapter, chapter four. How do we grow in righteousness? Um, first of all, backing up, what does it look like to be in sin? The Bible says it's to be enslaved to deceitful desires. Um, in other words, the, when, when the Bible speaks of our sin nature, what it's saying is we have desires within us that are deceitful. In other words, they lie to us. Like, I really want to do this. I really want to do this. And that desire is actually lying to me. Right? Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird concept, right? Deceitful desires. You have desires within us. We all have desires within us that lie to us. They're not telling us the truth. They're promising things to us. That this is the path of life and joy. And it's not true. It's a lie. We have deceitful desires. This, by the way, quick side point. This is the foolishness of be true to yourself and follow your heart and follow your desires. That's, that's suicidal. Eternally suicidal if your desires are deceitful. If your desires are lying to you. Right? Uh, if they're telling you things that are not true. So we have deceitful desires. That's the nature of the sin, uh, of what sin looks like, right? But the way we put that off, the old man, is by being renewed in our minds. Right? And the way we're renewed in our mind is, is first and foremost, it's through the scriptures, through God's word, right? Um, that new self, the new man, is created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness, so what that looks like is we learn what righteousness is from the scripture. We learn actually what scripture teaches. We learn to see the beauty in scripture, the beauty in righteousness, right? So there is a beauty to righteousness. We learn that actually the path to life isn't sin. It's not lying. It's not um, a lack of self-control. No, those things lead to destruction. Actually, the path to life is actually truth, right? The, the path to, to, to life is actually self-control. It's those things that lead to life, right? And we do that through scripture. We do that sh through meditating and memorizing scripture, right? We do that through remembering what the gospel is and what the gospel has to say. I'll say a bit more about the gospel, right? But it's the gospel that teaches us to actually know this isn't the way to live. And the more we meditate on scripture and see what scripture has to say about these things, the more actually we are growing, we are renewed in our minds and we are putting on that new person. And that new person is defined by righteousness. So scripture has a role to play in this. Uh, keeping a good conscience. Um, I'm not gonna say too much about this because um, uh, if you were here, those of us who were here for the New Year service, that was what we spoke about. Um, the importance of keeping a good conscience. The Bible has lots to say about it, right? Um, so if righteousness is a breastplate, very practically what that means is, as Christians, if we want to wage war against Satan, we must do everything we can to do to have a good conscience before God. Uh, Acts 24, um, and this is all over the place, but Acts 24 verse um, 16, um, Paul says, So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Right? I strive always. I strive always. Um, 1 Corinthians uh, verse uh, chapter, uh, chapter 4, um, verse 3. I care very, very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not judge my, even myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. But you see what he's saying? He, he's saying, my, my conscience is clear. The Christian does everything they can do to maintain a good conscience. And what that means is that 
There is no area of my life in which I know I am conscious of that I am not walk, I'm walking in a way that dishonors the Lord. I am not aware of anything. That's what Paul says. Paul says, I have a good conscience. I'm not aware of anything against me. I think sometimes, I, I think I said this in New Year's, that sometimes that sounds odd to us. That sounds like some kind of perfectionism. It's not. It's not even close to perfectionism. And the reason for that is what Paul says. Paul says, ultimately, God knows our hearts, our motivations. God knows things that are even deeper than what we can tell. But let me be very clear. It is possible for a Christian to live in, with a clear conscience. A Christian can say, I, am not, I do not know of any way in which I am not, ple- I'm not conscious of any way in which I'm, not, I'm living in a way that displeases the Lord. I'm not conscious of an area of my life that I know that I'm displeasing the Lord. If that is not something we strive to do, it means we're seeking to wage war against Satan without the breastplate of righteousness. Because whatever that thing is, Satan will use that. Whatever area that is, Satan will use that. Christians can, we can. And it means also, right, that we're praying that actually God searches us, that God does a work inside us to search us Right? To search our consciences, to search us. Right? That's what the psalmist prays, Psalm 139. Search me and know me. Reveal to me if there's any wicked way in me. But I think for most of us, it's not even, we're not even at this. You were conscious. We, there's things you know of. There's stuff when we know of. Actually, the way I'm at work, the conversation I'm having at work, I know that doesn't honor the Lord. And we just push it to one side and you bury it. Um. This can be as simple as, as simple, not simple, as speeding, right? Literally, like, actually, I know every time I get in the car, I don't care for the speed limit. I know I speed all the time. It's fine. It's cool. That's, that's Satan's, Satan delights in that. Um, Satan delights in that. You can have, we can have a clear conscience before God. And you know what? That's such a beautiful thing in the Christian life. That's actually such a joy in the Christian life, right? I mean, it's not that we trust in our own righteousness, but by God's grace, we know there's nothing. And obviously, there's areas that we're growing in, and we're striving in, but there's nothing that we are consciously, look, ah, you know what, no big deal. So one of the ways we grow in the breastplate of the righteousness is actually just doing everything we can to, to maintain a good conscience. If there's conversations you need to have. Ah, I spoke about that person that way or I spoke to this person that way, and it's in the back of my head that I should have apologized, but I've just buried it. Like, do the work very practically. Super, super, let's get super practical. Set some time aside with a pen and a notepad and think, like, God, what, what would it need, what would it be required for me to have a good conscience before the Lord? What are the barriers between me and a good conscience before the Lord? And you'll be amazed at like the things that may come up. And do that regularly, right? Um, God wants us to have a good conscience before him. And having a good conscience before him is key to our fight against Satan. Lastly, um, the gospel. This is all of Romans 6, right? The reason why we read Romans 6 is this. Romans 6 basically is telling us one thing. Is that life where we were slaves to sin, that life is over. And now we're slaves to righteousness. The gospel, the gospel helps us, right? The gospel gives us this breastplate, right? It's the gospel that tells us that actually, again, let me rewind. Back to that issue of you don't have a good conscience. Often the reasons why Christians don't have a good conscience about something is because you just think, I don't want to bring this up because if I bring this up, I know I'm going to have to change and I don't think I can change. And the gospel reminds you that that's a lie. Because the gospel reminds you that that life where you were slave to sin, that life is over. There is no sin that you are enslaved to. You don't have to do anything sin, in terms of sin. You're not enslaved to sin. The Christian has been set free from sin. Right? The Christian is now a slave to righteousness. I wake up in the morning thinking, I'm actually a slave to doing what God, God has bought me. And now my life is about pleasing him. But I'm not a slave to righteousness, right? And as surely as Christ died, that life, which was a slave to sin, that life is dead. That is as true as the death of Jesus Christ. And that new life that's about righteousness, 
that is as true as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What is true of Jesus Christ is true of me. That's what the gospel teaches us, right? So it's the gospel, right? The gospel. The gospel is what gives us strength to fight strife for righteousness. And it could be, and this is true for all of the weeks, it could be um, that this is, this is one reason why uh, our fight against Satan has not been successful. Right? I should probably say this every week, but you need the whole, the Bible says, put on the whole armor of God. It's not, don't put on one piece. Don't say, I've got one of the sandals. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Even if you had everything and you didn't have the breastplate of righteousness, what's, what's the enemy going to do? He's going to stick a spare in your chest, right? Um, we actually need the full armor of God. So all of these things, all of these things, all of them are essential in our fight against uh, Satan, right? Uh, so we do it by, again, Scripture, we do it through maintaining a good conscience, but we do it by reminding ourselves of the gospel. Keep telling ourselves of the gospel that through the gospel, by the power of the Spirit, we have the power to be righteous, to grow in righteousness, to be slaves of righteousness to, to God's glory. Let me pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you, Lord, for this passage on the armor of God. Thank you for, yeah, Lord, that you don't just leave us without plan or strategy. Lord, you've actually given us the means. And Lord, forgive us where we've been so negligent of what you have to say about our fight against Satan. I pray, Lord, particularly as it pertains to this breastplate of righteousness. Lord, that we would strive to have that breastplate of righteousness by your power, by your strength. And Lord, we would see the difference it makes in our fight against Satan. Lord, help us now, even as we've heard the word. Lord, may Satan not steal that word from us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Cool. So we'll take a three, four minute break and then we'll do questions. When it comes to questions... Um, if you could just maybe come up and say, it uh, yeah, either come up and say it loudly or come and say it on the mic. If you don't say it on the mic, I'll just repeat it, but that way people at home will be able to hear. But we'll take a three, four minute break and then we'll come back and do questions.
Yeah, you had it. Not yet. No, it's good. This is Gordon. Gordon has a question anyways. All right, guys. Uh, we'll start now. Um, I'll just pass the mic. Now, um, I've got a couple of questions on the text, and I've got a question on the sermon, and then I've got a different question altogether, but I'll save the other questions that give other people room. Um, now, it was a very, very interesting and a very, very helpful study, because at the start, I would have said the dominant meaning is Christ's imputed righteousness, so I better keep the mind, whereas you're uh, saying actually it's our lived righteousness. But are not the two connected, really, in that we can only have a lived and growing righteousness on account of the definitive breach with sin, which takes place when we first trust in the Lord, born again and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Um, yeah, I mean, yes, yes, I'm sure, yes. So I think, yes, they're, they're, they're interrelated, um, and, and one begins the other, right? It's really important. You get so many things wrong if you can't dis if we don't distinguish between those two righteousnesses, we get so many things wrong. But yes, we become saved because of that righteousness that we are given, that status which we are given by faith in Christ, that leads to a lived righteousness. So yes, there is that relationship between righteousness as a status. So there are two there also to say, and I think I said briefly, but like um uh, I think when we talk about the helmet of salvation, I think the idea of actually imputed righteousness, something along those lines, is in the armor as well. We are saved from the condemnation and the reigning power of sin. Um, before he deals with specific pieces of the armor, uh, Paul says that, that you may withstand in the evil day and then stand. Do you think that indicates a progression in the Christian life, or are they essentially saying the same thing? Um, good question. Uh, I might have to get back to you on that. I think I need to look at the, I guess, relevant Greek terms. I think they're both related to the word stand. I'm not sure there's a massive dis distinction between the two terms. Um, so I think it might be reiterating the same thing, but I'll, I'll need to get back to you on that, yeah. Um. Does the breastplateness matter? So, why is the breastplate something different in one Thessalonians five five eight? Um, in short, oh, that's loud. In short, uh, no, no, not really. I think so, sometimes the way this um, people approach the armor is to spend a lot of time talking about why righteousness is the breastplate specifically. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a joint metaphor, um, so we have to be careful to not almost overanalyze it. Um, so yeah, so First Thessalonians 5, 8, let me read that. Um, uh, um, there's another point in uh, where Paul uses armor language, um, where he talks about, yeah, faith and love as a breastplate. So, um, no, all it goes to show is that actually these are all essential parts of the armor. Um, there are some that seem to be particular. So, like, that their faith is a shield seems to be particular, but you can see that in the way that Paul elaborates on it. Similarly with the sword of the Spirit, um, I think there's something particular about that. But by and large, I don't think we should spend too much time on that. The reason, though, why, at least in Ephesians, he's speaking of righteousness as a breastplate is because Paul is, uh, he's quoting from Isaiah. How do we avoid mistaking self-righteousness for righteousness? Oof, great question. Um... A few things. Number one, genuine righteousness, as in lived righteousness, always begins with righteousness as a gift. So any kind of righteousness that doesn't begin with being justified as a sinner is no 
genuine righteousness, right? It's self-righteousness. That's one thing you might say. But another thing you might say, and you see this in the Sermon on the Mount, particularly in the first part of chapter 6, but even where we are, one of the things that marks self-righteousness is self-righteousness always seeks to lower the standard. Self-righteousness seems to makes the standard some external thing. And it lowers the standard so you can... Let's say it's a high jump and you need to jump over this long, this thing. You can either say, boy, I can't jump. Or maybe I need help to jump. Or you could say, you know what, I can do it myself. But the way you do it yourself is you take the bar and you bring it down. And then you jump over it and you parade yourself for jumping over it. Well, that's what self-righteousness does. Um, it looks merely at externals, um, but it doesn't deal with the issues of the heart. So it's a sermon that Nate... Yeah, so helpfully preached on Sunday. Um, Self-righteousness can say, look, I've not murdered. Um, and yet, be boiling with anger. Um, so it lowers the standard of God's command. That's one way we can see um, that actually what you're dealing with is self-righteousness. Genuine righteousness is a root work. It begins from the heart, from the heart outwards. Right? It's not concerned primarily with the externals. It's pro- concerned primarily with our hearts um so yeah i think that's the main thing the other thing i'll say about self-righteousness self-righteousness is in general self-righteousness is marked by a desire to be seen by men by people as opposed to to be seen by god and again the sermon on the mount is fantastic on this Uh, we're looking at that in a few weeks but one of the things that marks about self-righteousness, they're doing things so that other people can see them as righteous, but it's not first and foremost directed towards God. Okay, two questions here. Um, is it possible for us as Christians to have righteous anger? And um, regarding Sunday sermon, is all anger sinful? How do you judge if a situation is a righteous anger situation? Uh, good question. Um, there are somewhat differing views on this. Uh, I think somewhat of a minority view. I think there's very little room for righteous anger. Um, I think 98 times out of 100, your anger is sinful. Um, um, and we need to be careful of... Um, we need to be careful of, um, yeah, defaulting to righteous anger. Um, because one of the things that characterizes anger is that we think our anger is righteous. Um, right? Um, James 1, um, and I think James 1 particularly is um, um, cautions us on this. So James 1... Um, Verse um, 19. My dear brother, brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry because human anger does not, the produ- does not produce the righteousness that God desires or the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So the Bible warns you against that default notion which says my anger is because I'm trying to be righteous for God. The Bible says the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Um, does that mean there are no cases? Um, I think anger in the Bible is often really related to this issue of judgment. Um, so obviously God is angry. God is angry in Scripture. And God's anger is actually related to his exacting of punishment. Um, um, and so I think where we are in the position where it's our job to execute punishment, there is a righteous anger that we are to exhibit. Um, so there, there are situations where, yeah, the government, the police should, there's a righteous anger. Parents, you might even say there's a righteous anger. Uh, so there are situations where, in one sense, that's our role to do. By and large, um, we should not be thinking of our righteous our anger as righteous, we should be passionate about truth. We should hate sin. But we should not be thinking of anger, by and large, as righteous. The last thing to say on that is, almost every time the Bible speaks about anger, human anger, 
it's negative. Um, Bible says Colossians 3, put away anger, put away all anger, um, rage. Um, it's part of the works of the flesh. So I, I think some, I, I, my fear is that I don't think the conversation on anger is biblically balanced. Um, at least when you talk about human anger. Yeah, if there's a role for it, it's a very limited role. If we, yeah. Sorry, just following on from that. Um, so I guess often you hear Christians say things like, you know, if, you, if a doctor loves, you know, if a Christian doctor loves life, they will hate things like abortion um, and things of that type of nature. So is that a situation in which a person is angry or would you define it as something different? Um, secondly, uh, texts like, when it talks about obviously how zeal for my father's house consumed me or um, consumed him or be angry but do not sin, um, texts like that, do you, do you see that then as suggesting that there are times for believers to be angry? I guess with, especially with regards to issues of justice or, yeah, yeah, I think even angry at regards to things like sin. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think this may seem like overly semantics, but I don't think so. I think we should be zealous for what pleases the Lord and we should hate what God hates. Um, um, I'm not sure that necessitates anger. We should hate sin. Um, we should be zealous for the things that please God. We should not be indifferent to sin. Um, um, now, the text, be angry but do not sin, um, again, this is one of those debated texts on this issue. To summarize what I think it's saying, I do not think it's an actual command to be angry. Um, the reason being, I think he's quoting from Psalm 3, um, where quite clearly it's seen, be angry, in one sense, by all means, you're angry, but do not sin. Uh, and the very next thing it says is, and do not let the sun go down on your anger. So I think sometimes that verse is used to suggest that Christians should be angry, but that's not what the text is saying. The text is saying you should deal with your anger, lest the next verse you give a place to Satan. So again, I just think in general, yeah, it's, it's, yeah I think, and it may be, by righteous anger, what we mean by that is, yeah, we should be passionate about and hate sin and so on. And that's very much the case. But I think, by and large, when the Bible uses the language of anger, it's, 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 yeah. <laughs> Sorry, last thing before Gordon comes. <laughs> um, so, do you mind just drawing a distinction, explaining the distinction between um, passionately hating something and being angry? if you can? Um, yeah, I think, uh, again, part of this might be semantics. I mean, w one, um, there is something about anger that is almost necessarily destructive, um, which explains, uh, in many ways, God's anger. God's anger isn't just, God's anger actually then does something. It burns. Which is why I think there are places where it's our role to actually enact justice. Um, hating sin is, yeah, we're grieved by it. Um, um, I'm not even sure if we use the language of frustrated by it, um, but it's different from, again, the kind of thing that would have us to, yeah, that would be destructive. Um, um, so we're agreed right. So for example, other text that's often brought into this is um, Jesus cleansing the temple. Um, I think Jesus is angry. Um, but I don't think Jesus is there is providing an example for what we should do. Um, Jesus is angry at his temple and then he judges the temple because it's his temple. Um, yeah, don't go to your local church that's teaching false teaching and start flipping tables. Um, Jesus can do that. Um, don't do that. <laughs> and if you do that, don't, <laughs> don't say you're from SBC, please. Um, um, yeah, so I think, yeah, yeah. But again, 
uh, it's not something I think I want to say too much on, except to say, at the very least, we've just got to be so careful with our hearts on this issue, at the least, that I think our default is to justify our anger. Um, and you can be sinfully angry even about right things. Um, so simply to say that it's the right cause, even that in itself doesn't justify it per se. Yep. I, I wanted to, if I may, gently challenge that perspective. Um, and it goes back to the sermon on Sunday and some of the questions that Richard was just answering. Um, I was struck, I meditated quite a bit on the sermon from last Sunday and struck that in the KJV and NKJV, it says anyone who is angry with his brother without a cause. Now, I checked the received text, it's not there. Uh, no, nothing corresponding to without a cause, nothing in the manuscripts. But clearly the translators uh, thought that, um, seemed to think anyway, that there, there would be occasions when one be justly angry with a brother, he who is angry with a brother without cause. So do you think there are no situations in which a believer might be justly angry with a brother, albeit that the teaching is to deal with that before leaving, even leave worship in order to deal with it or not let the sun go down on one's anger? Um, okay, briefly. Um say something briefly about the KJV. So the KJV, there are manuscripts that have a phrase without cause, which is what the KJV relies on. Um, they're just not the earliest manuscripts, so most people don't think that's, um, myself included, yeah, I don't think that's original. Um, no, but there are, there are, there are, there are, um, there are manuscripts that have that phrase so they've not they've not the kjv haven't done it just on their own authority they they they, they have uh, they're basing it on some manuscripts but i don't think that's i don't think that's the um yeah that's not the original reading um but more importantly um is there a case where you're justly angry with your brother and sister um no unless we're talking about actually you're in a position to enact some kind of discipline and that's what's happening, then no, I don't think so. I, I, th I, I don't think so. I don't think you should be, I think we can be aggrieved and so on. The, the problem with speaking of a just anger is, is that if anger is righteous, the command necessarily would be that we should be angry all of the time um, because of the nature of the injustice in this world. We, we should be angry. We should continually be angry, except the Bible just seems to suggest that that's not the case. Again, it's not something I'm willing to uh, die on the, on, the, on the hills for, but um, uh, I think, um, yeah, I think being, being angry, I think what Jesus is saying is quite pervasive. It's, it's quite... Um, um, uh, all-encompassing in that sense um, yes in terms of us and our brother and sister I think what you want to do is if you find yourself angry with your brother and sister so almost let's set that aside if you find yourself angry with your brother and sister what you can't do is stew in that so in one sense the justice of it or not justice of it what you need to do is to deal with that whether that's to go and point out your brother and sister's fault uh, whether it's to, yeah, go with someone else to point out their fault. But what Jesus is saying is you cannot allow for a situation where that's some kind of settled position um, where we are just angry with our brothers and sisters. We actually have to deal with that. At the very least, it is not an ideal situation. And the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to see this as we go on on weeks, the Sermon on the Mount is speaking in some sense in idealistic terms of what, so I think Jesus is, speaks quite absolutely. Um, but then, yeah, there's a lot of work to do in terms of what that actually looks like on the ground. Um, um, yeah. How do you change your heart? What if you are praying and your heart is not changing? Uh, how do we change our heart? I mean, in one sense, 
God changes our hearts. Um, yeah, God changes our hearts. Um, because God promises that he will change our heart. Ezekiel 36, God says, I will give you a new heart. Um, that's what God promises. God tells us that he will give us a new heart. So we can't change our own hearts. God can change our hearts. God has promised to change our hearts. Um, how do we do that? Number one, we do that by believing the gospel. Uh, we believe the good news of Jesus Christ. And we trust that God changes our heart through that. We read God's word. We pray. Um, there might be things that we're doing, practices that we're doing that are actually reinforcing sinful things in our hearts. But here's one thing I will say is, if you apply yourself to the means of grace, your heart will change. That's a guarantee. Because that's what God says. So what's not possible is, I'm, listen, I'm doing everything that God's calling me to do, um, but my heart just doesn't change. It's not true. And it's actually Satan that tells us the lie that there's something so different about us that even in the means of grace, we won't change. It's a lie. It's a lie. You, you are not that different or special or that sinful that God's means do not apply to you. Um, so yeah, apply yourself to the means of grace. Persistently, continually pray. Um, speak to a friend. There might, sometimes it's just unconfessed sin. So seek counsel. Ultimately, speak to your elders. I'll, you know, um, so, you know, seek godly counsel as to why. But yeah, if you apply yourself to the means of grace as God has called you to, then your heart will change. What's the purpose of Stephen's speech uh, to the Sanhedrin in Acts 7? It feels like he's telling them things they already know. Um, yeah, good question. Um, so, book of Acts, uh, chapter 7. Uh, we read of Stephen, who ends up being the first uh, martyr. Let me pull it up. Um... um uh, um, yeah, so in Act 7, Stephen does what the Bible does quite a lot. It gives a Bible overview. Um, it's great when the Bible does that because actually you get to see how the Bible is seeing the Bible, right? How the Bible is interpreting the Bible. So it's great to see what a Bible overview. So he gives a Bible overview and he's expecting that, yes, that the Sanhedrin are going to be following along with him um, but where he ends it, where he's leading to, is that actually these people, the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders, are exactly like their ancestors who persecuted the prophets. Uh, and the same attitude that led them to persecute the prophets is the same thing that led them to kill Jesus Christ. Um, and is going to lead them to kill Stephen. So Stephen is, is saying that actually... He's putting them into that context. Um, and of course, when they hear that, um, yeah, they, they are not pleased, to put it lightly, and they stone him and kill him. Um, but Stephen is, is putting them into the context of, um, of their ancestors who were unfaithful, Israel, who by and large was unfaithful to the Lord. Yeah, um, during the service, you, said, you mentioned about how um, Jesus spoke about not going into the temple unless you'd um, f um, made the right with your brother or sister. Um, and he was in Galilee. So do you think what, what the way Nate explained it on Sunday about people going out of church to make right? Because um, you said it wasn't a direct comparison about being in church as opposed to being in the temple. So do you think that is the correct way of seeing it? Like, do you even go to church b before making it right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I guess what all I was saying was that, um, yeah, even more so the truth for us than, you know, if, if people were to leave the temple, leave Jerusalem to go and resolve things, even more so, yeah, for church. But yeah, absolutely. I think the parallel was exactly right. Um, if you're going to come to church um, to worship God and you realize that, um, and it's amazing, right? Jesus isn't, doesn't just say you have something against someone. Actually, you realize that someone has something against you. Um, yeah, even then, you should leave and go and resolve that. So, yeah, no, absolutely. I think the application he drew was, was 
yeah, 100% the right one, which is that, yeah, if we come to church on Sunday, and, and, and that's one thing Sunday is, right? Um, it's many things, but it's, a, it's an opportunity to check that all is right with the Lord. Um, Sunday isn't just a day to just keep rolling. This is why, like, you actually have to prepare for Sunday. Um, you actually have to prepare for church. You have to prepare to, to go before God. I know sometimes it's just, you know, Saturday night, uh, whatever, whatever, I wake up late, world lap, mm, 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 hop in the car, this, that, that, drive crazy, get to church, boom, 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 walk in. I was going to, I won't say late. Walk in, um, and, um, yeah, and then, like, like no, you should, we, we should prepare for church. Um, we ought to prepare for church. And one of the things that we ought to be preparing, preparing for church is to make sure that there's things, there's not things that we need to resolve before we come to worship God. Because if we lift up hands on Sunday, but actually our hearts are preserved, then all of that is a sham. God doesn't hear it. Um, it doesn't do anything. And again, God cannot be mocked. God cannot... There's no amount of lifting your hands. There's no amount of crying in church. There's no amount of that that replaces the need to actually make right what you need to make right. So, but I think part of it is actually just, um, part of it is preparing for church. It's also the importance of stuff like the Lord's Supper where we even more intentionally, you know, spend time to examine ourselves. But yeah, um, yeah, before church, we should, we should do what we need to do to, be able to come to church with a clean conscience. Um, on the topic of righteousness, um, for those who have walked away from the faith, um, and you said th that if you're um, not continuing making the effort to live righteous, that can contribute to walking away. Um, for those who have done that, because it's been people in church who have pretended to wear the armor of God and not treated them well, um, what do you say when they're angry about that? And how can that be reconciled? I guess that's part A. But then if you are in a moment of despair and it's because you've not lived righteously, what, what encouragement, if, if you're thinking, oh, that's how I've got myself here, how then do you overcome feeling despair? I think, yeah, great question. I think the first question is, so, yeah, what do you do if, if part of the reason you've walked away is because just people who've been hypocritical, who've claimed to follow Jesus and haven't... Um, Yeah, I think sometimes Christians can be quick to dismiss that. We shouldn't be. Um, yeah, we, those who bear the name of Christ, people ought to expect us to live, to be striving after righteousness. Where we are not striving after righteousness, um, that's destructive. That's destructive. Uh, Matthew 18, um, uh, and, and let me say particularly, let me say particularly, um, when that when we're talking about leaders who in the church who are not living righteously um yeah we ought to be particularly sensitive to that um matthew 18 um verse 6 um jesus says if anyone causes one of these little ones those who believe in me to stumble it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come. But woe to the person through whom they come. So, in one sense, what I want to say is, ultimately, someone who walks away from the faith, from the church, for that reason, there's a sense in which they bear responsibility for that. But there is a sense in which, almost humanly speaking, it can be the case that someone has caused this person to stumble. And the first thing to say is Jesus says, the fate for those who do that um, will be intolerable. Jesus hates that, right? So I think sometimes it's like, it's so easy to dismiss, but Jesus actually says there can be such a thing as someone stumbles in their faith because of the behavior of someone who would claim to be a Christian. Um, that happens, um, particularly with leaders. So... I think you want to show a lot of sympathy, um, but ultimately, um, you want to point them to Jesus Christ. Um, um, 
this faith is about Jesus Christ. It's about Jesus. And the question you always need to ask is, what do you make of Jesus? Right? And people, there are hypocrites. And the one thing I would say often is that, like, I'm reminded of is that the Bible says there are wolves in sheep clothing. So sometimes when there's hypocrites in the church, or even teachers who are hypocrites, sometimes that's used as evidence against the Bible, against the faith. But in reality, the Bible assures us that that's the case. There are people that seem to be Christian who are not, who are actually wolves. So when you see that, that doesn't somehow bring into question Jesus' faithfulness. Jesus said that would happen. Um, and I think I'd want to encourage that person with that. If, um, if someone's in a latter phase, and you might be in this phase, where you're like, you've despaired, and the reason, reason, the reason why you despaired is because of just a failure of righteousness. Um, you just need to look, hold to the promises of God. Um, you just need to hold to the promises of God. If you come to Jesus Christ, he will take you. Um, I've said this before, but it's just, for me, in this particular battle with assurance and so on, and sin, John 6, right, Jesus, all those who come to me, I will by no means cast out. That, that verse, I, will, I don't think I ever, could ever forget it. It was so key to me, so critical, so crucial to me, that actually, doesn't matter where I am, doesn't matter what's happened, if I come to Jesus Christ, he will take me. It will take me. Because sometimes it's like, you know what, I've just, I've gone too far. Maybe I'm just not chosen by God. Maybe I'm just not thing. Maybe I'm not. And you can get your head into all kinds of different things that can aid your despair. And one of the things that's helpful is just, if you come to Jesus Christ, he will take you. Um, so wherever you're at, if you're coming to Jesus Christ, however much you failed, um, you can come to Jesus Christ. Um, when Peter says, someone sins against me and they say sorry how often shall i forgive seven times jesus says 70 times seven right um that speaks to god's forgiveness there's not a limit at the time in which if you go to christ christ will have you as you are if you go to christ christ will have you um and i think uh and he'll change you um but you've not somehow sinned your way out of god's grace and i think that that's the thing you want to remind the person Um, I'm reading a book on uh, Christianity and technology, and the author suggests um, or says that God can inspire the inventors of things that we cannot morally endorse, and cites Isaiah 54, 16 as evidence for that. Do you think that's the case? Do I think that's the one? The case, that God can, that God can in- inspire the inventors of things that we cannot morally endorse. Morally endorsed. Well, firstly, let me look at Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54, 16, was it? Um, uh, let me see. So, Isaiah 54, 16. Um, See, oh yeah, see it is I who created the blacksmith who fans the coals into flame and forges a weapon fit for its work. And this is I who have created the destroyer to wreak havoc. And then it goes on to say, no weapon formed against you will prosper or prevail. And you will refute every tongue that accuses you. So, okay, so, um, yeah, I mean, in one sense, definitely, for sure. Um, all creativity actually ultimately comes from God. Um, in a more gener- general sense, yes. If we don't, it depends what we mean. I don't mean that God gave them a vision of it um, to make it. But yeah, of course, all creation, all invention in one sense comes back to God. Um, even things that end up being used for all kinds of crazy, ridiculous, evil purposes, it still comes back to God. Um, so yeah, there are things that you could say, in one sense, yeah, it's by God's providence design. God is the one that gave them the mind to create it. Um, but yeah, it could be almost entirely evil. Yeah. Um, quick question. So other than the essentials, what sort of things would you keep in mind when witnessing to a Muslim? 
Um, great question. Um, witnessing to a Muslim, uh, I think the main things I would say is, um, maybe the first thing I'll say is, most Muslims that you encounter, like Muslims, when Muslims teach Muslims about like apologetics and stuff, it's almost entirely how to have conversations with Christians. Um, Muslims are trained to have conversations with Christians. Um, if you had a number of conversations with Muslims, you will know that there are certain things that are going to come up again and again. Where did Jesus say he was God? Uh, you know, in the Bible, and you know, how can there be, you know, God and the Son of God? And so th there's just set things. So a lot of it is going to um, uh, revolve around the Trinity. Um, so I think that's the one thing to be aware of. Um, or they'll say things like, oh, you know, we believe in Jesus too. And they'll start all the things that they believe that's similar to what the Bible says, fully aware that <laughs> of the significant differences. Um, I would say, uh, in my experience, the thing to focus on, I, I won't spend too much time going through issues of the Trinity, the thing to focus on is um, how their sins are dealt with. Um, because Islam has a view of a God who is just. Um, yeah, I think the conversation with a Muslim, I think you want to speak to like how, how your sins going to be dealt with. One, two, the issues of assurance. Because a Muslim cannot know that, cannot actually know that they are saved. They can think they've done enough, but they can never know. Of course, there's no atonement, right? There's no actual forgiveness of sins, so you can't actually know that you're saved. But the question, I think, is, yeah, given God's justice, how is forgiveness possible? Um, I think, so this is true, but you want to stay very close to the gospel um, and get to the gospel. I think you want to avoid spending too long on the Trinity because sometimes... At least in my experience, you feel like um, you're explaining it, to them, but they actually know what you're. They're just they're just trying to uh, trap you. Like that's the conversation they want to have. I think having a conversation about sin, um, and making it personal, I think is often a lot more helpful. Um, why were the high priests um, giving Saul letters of permission to go into the synagogues so he could um, take Christians to jail? Were the high priests not Christian? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, so, the, no. So, the high priests are part of the Jewish system um, at the time, um, who by and large were opposed to Jesus Christ. So, they are part of the group that actually put Jesus to death. So, no, they're not Christian, they're opposed to Jesus Christ, and that's why they are supporting Paul and trying to arrest and ultimately even kill Christians. So, Although we do read of some priests that come to know Jesus Christ, by and large, the, the priests were yeah, opposed to Jesus, did not recognize Jesus as the Messiah, and thought, therefore, he was a deceiver, and, yeah, were, were opposed to him. Does the sheet described in Acts ten sixteen signify something, or is it just part of the story? I think the sheet that's being referred to is Peter sees a, a, a vision. Um, this is when the gospel is about to go to Gentiles. Peter sees a, a vision with a sheet, and on the sheet are these unclean animals. God tells Peter to eat these unclean animals. Peter's like, nah, never. I'm never going to eat the unclean animals because he's not meant to eat the unclean animals. And God's response is, yeah, do not call unclean what I have made clean. And really, it's a vision that's speaking about the Gentiles who God has made clean. Uh, God has actually, through the gospel, made them acceptable before him. Um, is the sheep? No, I don't think the sheep has any particular significance. I think it's just part of the story. Um, I could be wrong. Uh, maybe one more. It's a, a double question. Um, is there a difference across denominations of Christians in terms of being saved and not being saved? And should your future spouse be of the same denomination as you? Uh, good question. Um, first question, yes. There are denominations which you would say as a whole are not Christian, though they claim to be Christian, for sure. 
Um, Jehovah's Witnesses would be a great example. Um, why? Because they don't believe that Jesus is God. Um, so really, at that point, the fact that they might call themselves Christian, really, you don't agree on who God is. Like, it's not the same religion. So you might call it a denomination, but it's not. It's, denomination is really a wrong use of term. It's a different God. If I say Jesus is God and you're saying Jesus is not God, then at the very least, <laughs> we don't worship the same God. It's not the same religion. Um, but I say that because sometimes Jehovah's Witnesses will claim to be some kind of Christian denomination. It's not. Uh, Mormonism, very much the same. Um, even the Roman Catholic Church, um, in terms of its official teachings, is not, doesn't hold to a saving gospel. Now, let me say on that, that doesn't mean that there are not Christians within that denomination. Someone could be a Roman Catholic and genuinely believe the gospel, you know, genuinely believe that they're saved by faith and faith alone. So there can be Christians in it. But when I say a denomination, if I say it's not Christian, what I mean by that is the official teachings of that denomination, if you were to believe that, you would not believe in be believing the, the gospel, the biblical gospel. Yeah. Um, so there are denominations like that. Maybe just a, a, a quick thing on that. Sometimes it kind of feels like um, it's not nice to, um, you know, everyone that says they're a Christian, you know, they should just, you know. Um, that's just not what the Bible says. There are many people that name the name of Christ that don't believe him. And the Bible says this is what it looks like. There is such a thing as the spirit of the Antichrist who denies that Jesus came in the flesh. Like doctrine matters is what I'm trying to say. What you believe about Jesus matters. Simply to say you're a Christian, you know, doesn't mean you're a Christian, right? Um, so that's the first thing. Um, secondly, should you and your future spouse be of the same denomination? Depends. Number one, if you're talking about one of those denominations that is not actually Christian then, yeah, for sure you don't want to do that. Um, mostly because in all likelihood you'd be marrying an unbeliever. That does, there could be a reliever, but the first thing I'm having is we're having a conversation, and if you knowingly, knowing what your denomination actually teaches, you're holding to that, I don't have any reason to affirm your faith. In which case, you're talking about a believer marrying an unbeliever, and the Bible's clear on that issue. Um, within... Um, denominations, of which there are many, where you would say they hold to a saving gospel. You know, Baptist, Anglican, Baptist, no, I'm, um, <laughs> I'm not even that, Baptist. Um, Baptist, Anglican, Presbyterian, whatever, like, um, depends, again. Um, there are some things you just have to agree on just practically. That'll make it tricky. So, for example, are you, you going to baptize your kids? Like, you're either going to baptize them or not, you know? So, you need to be able to agree on that kind of an issue. There's some denominations which do that, um, which, again, still preach a, they preach a saving gospel. There's some denominations that don't, but, like, practically, you're going to have to that's going to be an issue down the road. Um, there are other things that you might say, yeah, if you just have wildly different views of what the Christian life looks like and so on and so forth, marriage is hard just already on a normal day. Um, so be careful about the kind of additional, you don't want to up the level of difficulty unnecessarily. Um, so I think there's a, where you can have similar convictions about things is definitely preferable. Obviously, the main thing is you would need to be able to come to a compromise about what church you're going to actually go to. Yeah, I'm not a believer in the husband and wife going to different churches. Um, so you, you'll need to, if it's at the level where I wouldn't go to your church, you wouldn't come to my church, then maybe let's just call it a wrap um, and just, just, just cut it off there. Um, so yeah, I think just practically, but again, seek counsel on that. Um, if you, again, but that's if we're talking about denominations that are, actually do preach a, a kind of saving gospel. Great, uh, let me pray for us. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for, yeah, the, the reminder of the breastplate of righteousness and the role it plays 
in our fight against Satan. Lord, I do pray that you would, yeah, by your grace, um, work in us, Lord, to be putting that breastplate on. Um, help us to be putting it on by your power, by your strength. Um, yeah, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Great. So, hopefully we'll be back next Wednesday. Uh, back downstairs with the normal setup. So, thanks.